Hi there, and welcome everyone to another episode of my Finding Wendy podcast. So first of all, I think it's important to mention that I am in no way an expert, licensed medical practitioner or doctor. So the information that I'm sharing with you all is a result of my own research and the research of others that I've studied. All right, so let's get to it. So, as I mentioned before, welcome to another episode of Finding Wendy, My Journey to Wellness. And today, we're exploring a fascinating topic. Your brain is hardwired to eat. So, let's discuss how our brains are wired in relation to eating habits and strategies to rewire these habits in a healthier direction. So I'm going to share some personal experiences dealing with cravings and emotional eating. So let's dive right in. So first, let's talk about how our brains are wired in relation to eating habits. Our brains have evolved and ensure our survival. And so one key aspect of this is making sure we seek out and consume food. So hunter-gatherer, as we've all heard. So the brain's reward system plays a significant role in this process. When we eat, especially hot foods and high sh- that are high in sugar and fat, our brain releases dopamine, a neurotransmitter that makes us feel good. And this reward reinforces the behavior that encourages us to seek out those foods. Again, I want more chocolate. (laughs) Okay, so however, in this world where high-calorie foods are readily available, this wiring can lead to overeating and cravings, contributing to obesity and other health issues. Uh, Duh. So the brain's response to food can become so strong that it overrides signals of fullness, leading to emotional eating and binge eating. You know, I've been listening to the Huberman Lab podcast hosted by Dr. Andrew Huberman. And in a recent episode called The Science of Hunger and Medications to Combat Obesity, Dr. Huberman interviewed Dr. Zachary Knight, a professor of physiology at the University of California. It's been incredibly interesting, and I've learned a lot about the drive to eat from this particular episode. So, I recently listened to this two-and-a-half-hour episode of the Huberman Lab during a long drive uh, recently to visit my family, and I thought it would be interesting to share different parts of this episode over the next few weeks. So in this episode, I wanted to point out the incredible discovery about genes, mutations, and the fat gene in particular. I know many people don't have time to listen to a two and a half hour episode, so I thought it would be helpful to create a condensed summary of what they spoke about in this episode. In this episode, they discussed weight control, the drive to eat food, and the differences in obesity between North Americans and Europeans. The most interesting point was when Dr. Knight confirmed the hereditary nature of obesity, mentioning an obesity gene. You know, I also took part in an obesity study at Toronto General Hospital, where they discovered that I indeed have this genetic mutation, the obesity gene. So this confirms why my entire family has a tendency of becoming overweight or is obese, because it is genetically passed on from mother to daughter, in my case. In this podcast, Dr. Knight discusses the strong genetic influence on body weight, highlighting that the brain controls behavior and energy expenditure. He points out that mutations in brain-related genes significantly significantly impact body weight, aligning with twin studies that estimate body weight's heritability at about 80%. Dr. Knight also emphasizes that despite no recent genetic changes, body weight remains one of the most heritable traits, second only to height. He notes that most diseases are less heritable than body weight. So there you have it. It was one of those Oprah aha moments when I was sort of punching the air with my fists. 
as I was driving on the highway, sort of celebrating that because I have inherited this obesity gene, it's not my fault that I have this tendency of being overweight and obese. It really gave me a sense of relief. It was one of those moments where I felt this overwhelming feeling of relief come over my body and feeling more at peace with myself. It's not my fault. It's not my fault that I'm overweight. And now with this information, I can move on and work on making sure I don't regain more weight after my bariatric surgery. So that comes back to the question that always that I always ask because of the fact that I lived in Europe for 20 years. And I have many family members that probably also have this obesity gene who are not obese. So now, why is it that North Americans in general are bigger than Europeans? So then Dr. Knight explains that while genetics determines a person's propensity for body weight, the environment can shift this tendency, causing most people to become heavier. He uses the analogy, analogy, genetics loads the gun and the environment pulls the trigger to illustrate how genetics sets the potential and the environment activates it. So the genetics, being obese, loads the gun, but the environment, where you live, being Europe or in North America, pulls the trigger to illustrate how genetics sets the potential and the environment activates it. He then further discusses how changes in the environment, including the prevalence of ultra-processed and highly palatable foods, have triggered latent genetic mutations in some people, making them more sensitive to these foods. While these individuals may have remained lean in the past, the current environment leads them to gain significant weight due to their heightened sensibility to such foods. So basically what he's saying is that in North America, North Americans tend to eat a lot of ultra-processed food, which makes them gain weight. But then on the other hand, Europeans consume more whole foods that are not processed. You know, when I lived in Amsterdam, I used to go shopping every day for fresh fruits and vegetables and ate fresh fruits and vegetables every day. I didn't really eat processed foods. And also, um, if you've ever been to Europe, you might have noticed that Europeans walk a lot more. So after dinner, it's common for entire families to go for walks. I'm on a journey to only eat whole foods myself and avoid all processed foods that comes in packages. This is the first step to avoid putting garbage into your body. This garbage that includes excess salt and excess sugar. I'm focusing on eating fresh fruits, vegetables, um, meats, and as much as possible. So I felt a huge sense of relief when I listened to this podcast as Dr. Knight had done an incredible amount of research and experiments to explain that my being overweight or the way my brain processes or approaches food is basically a mutation. I am a mutant human. <laughs> LOL. <laughs> it's hilarious. I'm okay with that. It sort of gives me a sense of relief that it's not my fault that I gain weight and that I have to realize that I am prone to gaining weight, more prone to gaining weight than others if I don't watch what I eat. So now what I wanted to do is to add at the end of my uh, each episode is to read you an excerpt or chapter from my book that I've been writing for the past 10 years. And in this particular chapter... Um, where we talk about my obsession with food, I think is exactly a perfect addition to this episode and a deeper dive into the way my Wendy brain works. So I hope you enjoy this reading, me reading you this chapter from my book uh, called Finding Wendy, which has not been published yet, um, but hopefully will one day because <laughs> it's still a work in progress. So here we go. 
Chapter 14. The Yo-Yo Effect. I was showing a picture of myself that was taken back in 1989 in Amsterdam to a colleague yesterday at my office. It was a picture that was of my student card when I was a music student at the Amsterdam Conservatory. She said, you look like a movie star. I was, of course, embarrassed by her comment, but even sadder that 20 years later, I had let myself go and become this big, overweight blob. From 1987 to 1989, I was also on a huge diet. I lost 200 pounds back then, and shame to say, gained it all back. The diet followed that I followed back then wasn't very smart, and it was pretty unhealthy. But looking back, the one thing that I did incorporate and that I have now discovered is essential is exercise. I can still remember reaching my goal and feeling so good about it. Lots of new doors opened up for me. I was 29 years old, pretty good looking, and all of a sudden the world started noticing me in a different and more positive manner. I don't really remember the details as clearly now as to why I started the diet, the light bulb moment, for example, but I do remember the rituals. And one of them that really worked was to eat a half Half a Granny Smith apple every hour. Believe me, I got sick and tired of apples, but by the end, they really helped with the end results. I had recently read up about this method, and it has been proven to really help with weight, the weight loss process, mainly boosting your metabolisms and the enzymes in Granny Smith's help burn fat. So I remember going to a homeopathic doctor in Holland, and he had designed this diet for me including the apples, but also cutting out all things like chocolate. I was not even allowed to eat even a gram of chocolate. Nothing. Nada. I was allowed to eat carob, though. I snacked on some carob I found in the local health store that had nuts and raisins. I can't really remember the rest of the restrictions from the diet. These two things popped out to me 20 years later. The results of losing 200 pounds back then was also a feast for me in clothes. All of a sudden, me, Wendy, who swore she would never wear a dress, was wearing skirts and dresses with high heels to boot. Another effect was the attention I received from the male gender. I was starting to flirt and go out (coughs) with several men, but... With all this positive attention from men, the thing I was shocked and disappointed the most about was the reaction from my male colleagues in the opera orchestra at the time. For years after our opera performance was done, we, the orchestra members, had to wait around for the rest of the stage crew to strike the set and or the soloists and the choir to decostume, costume de-mic up, and uh, before we all got into our touring bus and drove back to Amsterdam. I worked for 20 years in Amsterdam in a touring opera company. I played principal horn with the orchestra. We toured all over Holland, Belgium, Germany, and Switzerland. Anyway, back to my colleagues. So after our performance was done... The brass section would always sit together in a bar and have a drink while we were waiting. Now that I was skinny and good-looking to them, they all of a sudden were inviting me to join them for a drink and reflect on the night's performance. In all the five years I had been working there, they had never done this. Not until I lost 200 pounds, they all of a sudden noticed me and want me to join them. It was the part and the fact that really hurt me and shocked me into gaining the weight back. Gaining the weight back was slow, but study, but a steady road to my prior fatness. It took two years for me to lose 200 pounds and six months to gain it back again. Very sad, but it happened. What was shocking and hurtful for me was that I was invisible and a fat, ugly blob to my colleagues for many years and they only reached out and became friendly to me when I lost the weight after gaining back the weight my colleagues went back to their old ways and just ignored me I was invisible after the performance as they used to 
Every now and then, they would hurt me more and say, Oh, my Wendy, what happened? You were so beautiful, and you gained all your weight back. You should start eating those green apples again. Such a pity. Ouch. You're talking to a person, you know. I have feelings, too. There are, of course, other troubles and issues around the reason why I gained the weight back. On a practical note, what I didn't realize, and what I certainly know now, is that diet and exercise is not a temporary state. A diet is to become, in a form, or the recipe for your permanent lifestyle for the rest of your living days. This is the reason why so many people yo-yo back to the original weight. Because when you reach your goal, you go off your diet and go back the way to eating the way you used to. Wrong. So when I go to my gym at night, I'm surrounded by beautiful, beautiful skinny women. At first, I thought, why are all these skinny women working out like dogs at the gym? They're not fat. Well, now I now discover the reason why they're skinny is because they're going to the gym. <laughs> And it's a part of their lifestyle regime. These women have been involved with sports during high school. Remember those jocks at school? And after high school, continued their exercising at the gym. Well, in the meantime, I was the band aide, meaning the band helper, the geek, always in the band room in high school, and just sat and watched very popular, pretty young girls play volleyball or basketball as I stuffed my face with cheesies and orange crush as they sweat off their calories. So going back to the beginning of the story, I was talking about the unhealthy part of my diet. The part that I didn't mention is that I only ate every other day. Yep, I fasted for an entire day every other day. I didn't eat food at all, so no food, nothing. Not a thing for three out of seven days a week. Was that the bad part? Who knows? Maybe so unhealthy? Who knows? But for one thing for sure was, man, I was strong. Not eating for a whole day, just drinking water was a sure sign of willpower. So is willpower the key to success? End of chapter. I hope you liked this chapter from my book, I also wanted to mention that I've written a children's book, and it's actually uh, originally a chapter from this book that I've been writing for the past 10 years, and I've turned this particular chapter into a children's book, and I've published it on Amazon um, last December. Um, I placed a link to the book in the description part of this podcast, or you can simply find it by searching the book title's name, which is called Wendy Rides an Elephant by Wendy Lamberti. It's on Amazon, and it's a children's book. It's only $10, and you can get it, um, the physical book, or you can get it as a Kindle book. And I really enjoy writing, and it's a lot of fun to, to write. And hopefully my second children's book will land on Amazon by Christmas. So check it out. Please remember to leave a review about the book if you decide to buy the book, because that will help with the algorithm when other parents are looking for a great children's book that my book will actually come up in their search so and also i wanted to note it's actually a true story so enjoy well that's all the time we have for today's episode i hope you found this discussion on how our brains are hardwired to eat and the strategies to rewire uh, and all the habits and information uh, helpful. Remember, it's a journey and every small step counts. So thank you for joining me. And don't forget to um, check out uh, the Huberman podcast, the Huberman Lab. There's a link below here in um, my episode to that particular episode. Um, so if you have any questions or topics you'd like me to cover, please reach out and uh, remember that your mental health is just as important as your physical health. So until next time, take care and be kind to yourself. Bye-bye for now.